what's happening what's happening guys i apologize i had a little technical issue on that first run but welcome back welcome back welcome back yeah yeah um today i'm going to approach this from a different angle gonna hit it and quit it real quick can i hit it and quit it yeah we're gonna hit it and quit it really quick but nevertheless um this is one of my um black history chats and today today i'm talking about the most important guy at the grammys in 1984 yeah 1984 went all the way back to 1984 but it's important this this marked a pivotal point in african-american history in particular in in music right and we cannot cover black history without covering music a lot of times black history people primarily focus on the civil rights movement but there were major accomplishments that happened in music that is a part of black history and that is what i'm covering here today right and you know i'm talking about the grammys well tj how is the grammys a part of black history <laughs> Get your coffee, and I will explain how and why. All right. And, you know, we need to go back a little bit because typically awards, especially those award shows hosted in Los Angeles, California, were primarily for white audiences and white um, songwriters and white singers and bands, right? They used to throw the black artists in as a little novelty piece because that's how they looked at R&B. R&B, even though they loved the music and out of uh, rhythm and blues came rock and roll, it's extremely difficult for these people to get, you know, black artists to get notice, to get recognition for their work, you know? And this such was the case with the 70s man we had we had a lot of albums in the 70s that got the snub from the grammys legendary snubs <laughs> you know unless you were stevie wonder who they absolutely could not snub right songs in the key of life and all of these you know and it was still some categories he should have won with songs in the key of life that he didn't get that went to um went to white artists we saw a huge amount of disrespect in the 70s uh for african-american artists right and all but non-existent in the 60s you know um not from a grammy standpoint but you know american music award standpoint just industry-wide because some of these award shows w w don't really date back that far but the amount of disrespect now what they would do to the african-american artists is that they would have them come on and to to perform and back in the day, one of the running jokes was if they had you on to perform nine times out of 10, you wasn't going to win. It wasn't until later in the game that if they brought you on to perform, you're going to win. But back during the 70s, if they brought you on to perform, that was a pacifier for the fact that we're going to give the award to Karen Carpenter or the Doobie Brothers and not you, <laughs> you know, so the racism was thick and it, it's not just the times like when Kanye ran up on the stage and said, Kanye, when, when, when Taylor Swift was up there and Kanye says, Beyonce should have won, you know? Beyonce had the best album all time, blah, blah. Nah, uh, it's not the Beyonce um, Adele um, controversy that broke out, right? You know, but you would always have these artists like Taylor Swift and Adele that would knock out artists that we just thought was a hands down, you know, was a shoe in to win. And some people say that's what makes the competition fair. Then others say, no, it's a lot of racism behind uh, these Grammy Awards. And I remember watching, even as a kid, watching the American Music Awards, which was thought to be the more liberal of the two. And having guys that we thought should have won. And they didn't. And, you know, well, part of that criticism is because um, a lot of rhythm and blues fans pretty much stay within the, the, you know, the category of rhythm and blues. And they didn't follow record sales. What's happening to Johnny D? They didn't follow record sales of throughout the industry. In the industry. And so when you saw these artists appear out of thin air and you're like, how in the hell did this guy beat, you know, 
the Jacksons. <laughs> you know, how did this how how did the, you know this group here beat you know Stephanie Mills and you're just scratching your head as to how these things were happening over and over and over again? And then a lot of African Americans are saying, you know what, this is racism. This is racism, you know. Was it? Yeah. A lot of times, yeah. <laughs> Because the the Grammys of had a, was the little brother of the Oscars, you know. This was the little brother, you know. With the Oscars became famous for these snubs, you know. Like, ah, oh, run along, little little black people. You don't know what you're talking about. Ah, oh, that wasn't the song of the year. Go ahead on. It was definitely Bruce Springsteen. Go ahead on. Get on out of here with that, you know. To watch a lot of these artists come from nowhere and win was was absolutely devastating. Watching, you know, you know, heavy heavy metal albums winning song of the year, in which no one could understand none of the lyrics. We sat through that, and we sat through that, and we clapped for them. You know, we just <laughs> we clapped. You know, with the Whitney Whitney Houston expression of shade you know we acknowledge them we you know but for years african-american artists have been treated um horribly by a lot of these uh, awards and a lot of these um you know endorsements and these you know the record companies didn't push the black artists during grammy time as they pushed some of their white artists. Did you know that there is a lobbying effort that goes into um, getting these songs acknowledged at the Grammys? It's not. It's not always. It's not as easy as an artist, you know, just making a great album and that's it. It's not that easy. You know, there were a lot of great albums that didn't get recognized. You know, didn't get nowhere near what we thought they should have got. You know, great, great albums. LB Shore. <laughs> LB Shore in 1989, 88 had a great album, you know? Hardly got anything. Hardly got, we thought it was great because it was played a lot in our communities, in our towns. So, but, but TJ, how, how does this connect to black history? It does. It does. Because there, it, was, it was a British guy, right? that Quincy Jones called in 1989, right? And in 1989, Quincy Jones tells this guy, he says, man, I have just heard the most talented person I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> there isn't a guy like this guy honored and I need you to come work with me. I need you to write songs for this artist, right? And it's like, you feel that good about him? Like the greatest you've ever seen? He said, he's the greatest I've ever seen. I haven't seen anything like him. You know, he's the most talented person on planet Earth, right? So Little the little the little white little, little British guy currently is working with another band. You know, Quincy Jones had this talent for taking people, band members, <laughs> and taking people musicians, you know, just just jacking them, just snatching them, you know, out of whatever they were doing and putting them in his stuff, you know, such as the bass player for Brother Johnson, you know, just uh, just snatch them, you know, or the keyboardist for Stevie Wonder, you know. Just snatch them and make them a part of his group. And, and such was the case with this little British guy. At the time that Quincy Jones contacts this guy, Johnny, this guy is working with a band called Heat Wave. Ever heard of them? And for Heat Wave, he had wrote three big, huge hits, you know? Boogie Nights. Remember that one? Boogie Nights. You may be a little too young, Johnny. Maybe a little too young, right? Always and forever. Always and forever. Remember that? Big monster, monster hits, right? This guy wrote for him. Well, Stevie, well, Quincy Jones snatched him. 
Shit, I need you to come right for me. Right? I got an artist. I think he's going to be big. He's going to be huge. But we need some songs. And Steve, you know, Quincy at this time had also plucked this solo artist out of the group that he was in because he was a part of a famous group. You know, it was a family of singers. <laughs> and Quincy takes this guy out of this group. He sees him on the set of this movie they're doing. And from the set of this movie, he's like, you know what? I can do something with this guy. So Quincy takes the guy who was the lead singer from the family group, puts him with the keyboardist writer from the group Heat Wave, right? Steals, steals the bass guitarist from Brother Johnson and steals the keyboard guy from Stevie Wonder. Takes all of those guys, right? Brings them all together for this one person that he felt was the most talented person he had ever seen in his life. And they begin to work on an album called Off the Wall. And it's with Off the Wall that the, the British guy who was working for Heat Wave wrote those big hits, hits for Heat Wave, scored two number ones right off top. Bow, bow. Right. Right off top. With Off the Wall from Michael Jackson. He wrote several songs on the album. Right, but he had two, two off the back. Here comes the Grammys, right? Here comes the Grammys, and they definitely thinking they're going to get something. They definitely think that they're going to th that something is going to happen here. Not really, not really. Uh, matter of fact, um, you know, Quincy was very disappointed because the work that they did on this particular piece, they thought it was. You know, it was some of the best work, you know, of that decade. That's how high it was on that. And so it, it, coming off the disappointment of Off the Wall, from their perspective, it was a huge, huge success for us. But the backlash had already started. Well, what was the backlash, TJ? Disco. The disco backlash is what hurt that album that Quincy absolutely loved you know uh, off the wall but the grammys you know just decided you know what we don't like this disco anymore even though you know some of the hottest songs out the, at the time were all disco songs you know this is still very much the disco era but they decided they just woke up in the morning and say hey we're going to shift gears right here and we're going to do something else in the 80s so the 80s comes along right quincy and crew all of these guys had projects scheduled after, after, after off the wall. They all had projects scheduled. Quincy was going to do that dude, right? And travel around the world with those, those songs, you know, I know Karina. Oh, you know, all them songs, right? All the eighties hit stuff, right? Um, James Ingram, Patty Austin, all of them took all of them. Lewis Johnson, you know, they already had this stuff arranged ready already, but the disappointment of, to them of off the wall is still in their chest they want revenge for off the wall so quincy turns to the little british guy again and say you know we, we want to come back again we want to do this again and they, they they totally disrespected us because that was my best work that they didn't even they hardly even acknowledged us for it you know and when you've put your heart and your soul in something, man, and people treat it like, you know, it, it does something to you. You know, it, it, you know, when you when you put something out and nobody's listening to it or nobody's reading it and you know you put your soul into this thing, it's either going to intimidate you or inspire you to, to top it. And they all agreed to come back again, right? And the sole purpose, guys, the sole purpose of them coming back again, that same group, the keyboard player from Stevie Wonder, the bass player from Brother Johnson, right? Adding James Ingram full time to the mix, right? And the 
keyboardist and songwriter from Heatwave. The whole purpose of this group coming back again was to earn respect from the Grammys. Why was that so important? Because if you scored big at the Grammys, you became the artist. Becoming the artist meant the sales. It meant the concerts. It meant the endorsements. So at this point in time, black artists are still not breaking through. Like they're doing great in R&B, in R&B radio stations. But you got, yeah, some places that didn't even have R&B radio stations. Okay. There's some places that, you know, this is the eighties. You had some people, some places that still had R&B being played on AM. People think it was just vastly mainstream because of the success that Motown had. No, you have a you have more competition now. And some of the hard rock, heavy rock, some of those things are dominating. And some of these black artists who, you know, are, are just really getting kicked to the to the side, or they'll get, you know, the big major cities, the big chocolate cities, right? They'll get those with no problem. It's just the in-betweens that were a struggle. Wasn't hardly getting hardly any television unless you were on um, Soul Train or Dick Clark squeezed you in on American Bandstand somewhere in between the Olsons, you know, and and Blondie. Yeah, it's somewhere up in there. But for the most part, that's how we're being treated. And it was this moment, guys. It was this moment. Like you can actually put your finger on the point where um, artists in the history of African American music began to get recognized, began to get noticed, began to get um, just from a, com a commercial, a retailing commercial standpoint. You know, we no longer have to create an album and put white people on the album. The album will sell with a black person. The art, the art, the album will cross over, not because the music crossed over, but because the other audience, the other races of people crossed over to that particular music. This is the first time, right? This is the first time from a from a monstrous retail standpoint that it happened. And it's when this group came back together, 1984, to work on, but it started much earlier. It started much earlier. It's actually production started on 82, going into 83, right? 82, early 82. And they get back in the studio. And you get what the beginning of the Thriller album, right? What made Thriller such a monumental moment for African American artists is because it is the first time that that we as artists received respect as not only performers but as songwriters and musicians and producers. It was just a huge, huge moment for us, but. The 84, 84 Grammys, right? So a split in the songwriting credits going to two individuals, right? One of them, Michael Jackson. And the other one is the one that I credit. I credit with finally helping African-American artists receive respect in the music industry. And that is a genius by the name of Rod Tipperton. A lot of people don't know Rob Tipperton, and that was almost by design because he intentionally stayed in the background. Rob Tipperton is a white guy from, from, you know, from across the pond. But his early success came with Heat Wave. All of those songs from Heat Wave in the late 70s, he wrote those songs every last one of them who was Rob Tipperton. Rob Tipperton also wrote songs for Brother Johnson. When you hear Brother Johnson really coming on in the in the, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s, right? Well, they didn't go that far into the 80s because Quincy Jones took the bass player, but <laughs> but prior to Quincy Jones taking a bass player, which is Lewis Johnson, 
the Brother Johnson is a group that he wrote for. You know who else he wrote songs for? George Benson. He wrote songs for James Ingram. He wrote songs for Patty Austin. He wrote songs for Michael McDonald. Pretty much over a six-year period. All of the major hits that you're hearing are coming from this one guy. At one time, man, he had six songs in the top ten. At one time, one particular week, six songs were in the top ten as a songwriter, right? But the combination of Rod Tipperton, Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson, right? It's epic. I cannot stress this enough. This is black history because prior to then, they just really didn't respect us. It took Michael Jackson going into the 84 Grammys and walking out of there with eight. Eight. Something that we had never... Imagine all of the performing James Brown did. Imagine all of the, the dancing James Brown did. Imagine all of the performing Ray Charles did. Never got any respect to that degree. You know? Just, just Earth, Wind, and Fire... Just unbelievable albums that came out during that time. The, the brilliance of this guy and Rob Timberton is, and his ability to write these songs for Michael, right? I can, I feel honestly, without his songs, we wouldn't have had that success that year. Without his without his songs. Guys, Rob Timberton wrote Thriller, wrote Human Nature. Right, all those songs. I mean, think, think of how big that is, right? And, and yes, we, 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 music transcends race. Music has always transcends race. If you don't believe me, look at, look at the sound of Philadelphia. I, I dare you to pull up the sound of Philadelphia, and pull up the band. Look at the race. Look at the diversity of that band. The people who wrote the song for a soul train. People all over the world. People who wrote that. Huh? Soul train. Ba -da -ba 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 -da -ba -ba -ba. Those amazing horns. Those white guys. So we cannot, we cannot tell the history of black musicians and, and black artists and, and, and music and leave white people out of that discussion because their contributions were just as important to history. Michael Jackson would not have made history that night if not for Rod Tipperton, not for those songs, right? Not for, and if you go back to, you go back a year before that, you had James Ingram and Patty and, and Patty Austin, right? They went for a duet, you know? So, you know, what this, what this guy is doing, you know, over this, over this run, and that wasn't really the end of him because he continues, but, but I want to just talk about 1984 because 1984 paved the way for Prince to come the next year. It was, it was Purple Rain. Anybody remembers this? Hello, mic check. It was Prince. It was it was the door was kicked open with Michael Jackson kicked completely open. Now it's commonplace. Now it's commonplace now for us to see all, you know, African-American artists recognized and win at this level, guys, we didn't always win at this level. I know you may think that this was, you know, yeah, the Grammys are on and, you know, all of these little, all of these guys, you know, now are just automatically going to just get something. It wasn't always there. You'll go sit there for five hours at the Grammys and walk out of that it's empty handed and then poured your whole heart and soul into something. Okay. And yeah, Lionel Richie was going up against Michael that night, but Lionel Richie had a phenomenal album that, she, that year, Dancing on the Ceiling. It's just unfortunate that he ran into this monster. This monster of an album called Thriller. Not only was all of the Grammys, but the record sales 
record sales that we that the industry hadn't seen since Elvis or the Beatles are both groups combined. Are both combined. So now what Michael Jackson does is prove that just by being Michael Jackson, without changing anything, a thing, that this album can sell in any record store across the around the globe. And it did with record sales that with, with records that some many of which are still set until this day, until this very day. But but what Mike, but Mike did it as a solo artist, right? Coming off of a boy band, coming out of this, out of this bubblegum music. Then the transition, as you saw with Off the Wall, right? Then from Thriller, right? They said history. They made history. And so today I just wanted to take a moment and recognize because he's he's gone. He passed. Rod Tipperton died a couple of years ago, right? And I just want to read off in tribute to Rod Tipperton. I want to read off some of his hits that he's had that he's had since 1977. 1977, he had Boogie Nights, right? Um, too hot to handle. Uh, slip your disc. 78, always and forever heat wave. Um, and Groove Line, Heat Wave, right? Eyeballing, Razzle Dazzle, all Heat Wave. And 79, he had Rock With You, Michael Jackson. 79, Off The Wall, Michael Jackson. Burn This Disco Out, Michael Jackson, right? Leave Me In, Rufus and Shaka Khan, right? 70, this is all 70, this is all 79. Stomp by Brother Johnson's, right? Stomp, Brother Johnson. Um, Light Up the Night, Brother Johnson, right? 1980, Give Me the Night, George Benson. Um, Treasure, Brother Johnson. Love, ex Love, George Benson. Gangsters of Groove, Heat Wave. Turn Out, The Lamplight, George Benson. Love Lines, Karen Carpenter, right? Um, Razzmatazz, Quincy Jones. Turn On the Action, Quincy Jones. Do You Love, Do you love Me, Patty Austin. Right, he worked with Herbie Hancock, letting it loose, um, getting it, getting to the good part. I remember that Herbie Hancock. Um, more Patty Austin, baby, come to me with Patty Austin and James Ingram. Okay, then yeah, Donna Summers, love is in control. Then he gets to Thriller. It's 1983. On Thriller, he wrote "Baby Be Mine," the lady in my life, right. Um, for the Manhattans, he wrote um, Spice of Life. For James Ingram and Michael McDonald, he wrote um, Yama Be There. Yama Be There. Yeah, it's a pretty good song, right? For Michael McDonald, he wrote Sweet Freedom. Uh, and uh, yeah, Climax, Man, Man Size Love. 1990, he wrote Secret Garden with Quincy Jones, L.B. Shore, Al DeBarge, Barry White, right? 1991, he wrote um, giving into love for Patty Austin. 1993, he wrote a song for Stephanie Mills, right? Um, he wrote Jeanne, 1994, Vibe. Um, LL Cool J sampled him for Hey Lover. It's A. <laughs> What's happening, Bama Girl? What's happening, baby? A tribute to your pops. Just for you. Thank you. Thank you for standing with me all these years. Appreciate you. But I just wanted to share that with you guys because Rob Rod Tipperton is history. He is, he is in fact African American history because it was because of Rod Tipperton that African American artists finally started getting recognition at events like the American Music Awards and the Grammys. And it paved the way for the success that you saw the next upcoming year with Purple Rain. And, and the list goes on and on and on. But I wanted to acknowledge him, right? Because he played the background. <laughs> you know, this is a guy that was perfectly okay with no one knowing his name or no one knowing what his contribution was. He died that way, guys. 
He died not wanting anybody to know what he actually contributed to. And the biggest album we've always we've known of all time, you know, has, has been something that he 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 wrote, you know. And there were other great songwriters. I'm not saying he is the greatest of all time. I'm saying in the combination, right, in the coming together, right, the way Quincy Jones was able to pull him in, recruit him, him agreeing to leave Heat Wave and come work with an artist that it really was unproven if he could sell without his brothers, and that's Michael Jackson. And for them to do Off the Wall and then do Thriller, right, and then pave the way for so many more. And the guy still died um, without anybody even knowing he had passed. It was it was like a, a brief little mention, a little blurt, a little here and there, you know. But people like me, I know I noticed. I took notice, right? Because I can appreciate contributions from people even if – you know, they're not black. I can I can appreciate their contributions to the overall advancement of African Americans. And this is why I always tell people don't forget what white people contributed to our story. It's easy to it's easy to dislike them, right? Because a lot of them on, on social media are in fact assholes. But you can never forget people like Rod Tipperton. You know, in the same breath as you can never forget, you know, um, F. Franklin Delo Roosevelt, right? You can never forget his contributions. You can never forget Bobby Kennedy and what Bobby Kennedy did, right? You can never, ever, ever, ever forget the progressives of the 1900s, right? And those who worked to form the N, the NAACP, right? Which were white and black involved in that you can never ever forget the philanthropists who donated money for southern and gramlin and 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 spelman and morehouse right who donated land so these schools can be built and the vanderbilts rockefellers you can't you can never forget these people right you can't forget you know people like cassius clay who lobbied president lincoln and said, and he even had a direct confrontation with Lincoln because it took Lincoln too long to free slave. Cassius Clay wanted Lincoln to free the slaves the day he got in office. When he was inaugurated, Cassius Clay wanted slaves free that day. He gave Lincoln two and a half years before he resigned. He said, it's taking you too long to do this. We elected you to free the enslaved Africans. You can't forget people like this, man. You can't forget John Brown. And, and and other abolitionists, the abolitionists, the Presbyterian abolitionists of Alabama. You can't forget these people and their contributions and the formulation of universities like, like Stillman for, for, for Africans, enslaved Africans. You cannot forget, you know, the, the, the people who donated land for Alabama State University. You can't forget these people. Right, because it's easy, like I said, it's easy to dislike them because when we reflect on everything that has happened to us during the course of our existence in this country, it's rough, it's still rough, but it's collaboration. It has, guys, it has always been collaboration that brought progress, for, even from the beginning, even from the first slave revolt. It's collaboration, even from the freeing of the Amistad enslaved Africans that were involved in that international controversy of what to do with this slave ship. Do we send them back and we continue on? Do we honor the wishes of the insurance companies in America or do we return them home? Right. It has always been collaboration. So on this particular day, even though this is Black History Month, I stopped. I paused. I remember Rod Temperton for his collaboration with Quincy Jones and proving that African American artists are just as good as anybody else, and our artists can sell, and our artists deserve your respect. They don't have to be historical, you know, emblems like Stevie Wonder and Diana Ross and the Legends of Motown. They can be up and coming new people, like a little girl who's singing by herself 
for the first time. And she sings a song called Dangerously in Love. The name is Beyonce. And she wins and she cleans house and she earns the respect. Well, you have to go back to 84 when Michael Jackson earned the respect of the entire industry. Why not place it all on Michael Jackson, TJ? Because without Rod Tipperton, it may have probably wouldn't have been. Not with those songs. He, Yes, Michael had the talent. But it took Quincy and it took the songs of Rod Timberton. And that's all I have for you guys today. I have to hit it and quit it. So I just wanted a little short piece. But um, hit me up, Bama Girl. I need to I need to bounce something off you. I need more information about your dad. Okay. <laughs> need more information about your dad. Guys, go back and look at my pieces I've done on the Pullman Porters, right? Um, this is a young lady who introduced me to this. I knew nothing about it. You know, she taught me what Pullman Porters was in every since those lectures, that private education I received from Bama Girl. I have been fascinated with them and their lives and their connection to the civil rights movement and how we how we became who we are because of a humble Pullman Porters named E.D. Nixon. So please go check out those videos. I'm going, hey, I got to hit the typewriter, man. I got to get to work. But love you guys. I'll see you on the next one. It's your boy, TJ.